sneaking its way in at number five, we've got Creep. This flick breaks it down to the bare essentials. Two dudes and a camera. That's all you really need to make a found footage horror movie. No big set pieces, no funky twists, no need for monsters showing up at the perfect time for nobody in universe to notice, just a maniac and a weirdo videographer and the things they do. It's simple, and it works so, so well. We open on a videographer being hired by a strange man who claims to have a terminal illness. He wants to record some videos for his unborn son, kind of like how every dad with a secret records stuff for their kids. Hey, kiddo, if you're seeing this, I'm probably dead. Haha, -ha, classic dad, right? Well, the haunted family heirloom is buried beneath your dog's grave, etc, etc. You get the picture. So, as these two men are trying to figure each other out, some dark secrets are revealed. Wolf masks are found, Benadryl is put into whiskey, the man with the illness isn't who he said he was, and more. It's actually all very effective, thanks largely in part to two excellent performances put on by Mark Duplass and Patrick Bryce. At times, it's tough to decide who the real creep is. The videographer has plenty of oddities about himself as well. Everything seems to have a double meaning, and nothing stays certain for long. Well, until it does, but we won't go there. Creep is a fantastic example of how to make something super simple work. Two characters and minimal unexplainable action prevents the flick from falling into the oh man something is happening let's see how all my friends are reacting trap that a lot of found footage is so fond of. It was even good enough to warrant a sequel and apparently a third's on the way. You go Creep. Twirling it at number 4 we've got VHS. I love bloody disgusting. I think the trend of horror based publications putting out movies is fantastic. Keep the money and the interest with folks who actually care. Brad Miska put this all together, five short flicks and a frame narrative. The frame involves a gang breaking into a house to steal a specific VHS tape for an unknown buyer. They come across a dead old man sitting in front of staticky TVs. And there are plenty of tapes in this abode so they have to get to work grabbing them all. As the crew runs around trying to get what they can, a lookout stays behind with the body and the TVs. This is where the first and arguably best short starts to play. It's called Amateur Night, and it focuses on some greasy pals getting together and renting a motel room. See, one of the boyos wants to get laid, and the others want to be in on it somehow. Weird. So they rig a pair of glasses with a hidden camera in order to capture the whole thing. Weirder. And then they head out on a bar crawl, looking for some ladies. Less weird, but still weird because of the first two things. The group ends up finding two girls who seem at least vaguely interested in them, and they regroup in the motel room after a few drinks. Quiet, shady Lily seems content just to creep around the periphery and see what happens, while the excessively drunk Lisa just passes out. With only one girl left, the boys get a little frisky. And then things get weird, scary, sexy, and wrist breaky. It's a fantastic use of found footage point of view, especially because they decided to go with the supposed glasses mount. This way, nothing feels forced, and at no point does the audience feel the need to scream out, just put the camera down for five seconds to deal with this. Outstanding stuff. The rest of the found footage flicks in the compilation are serviceable, but none reach the heights, pun intended, that Amateur Night does. Coming in at number three, we have Cloverfield. A found footage giant monster movie? Count me in. I remember the ad campaign behind this, and they got people excited to find out about the monster. By keeping it a secret ahead of the release, and for most of the movie, it made for a fantastic word of mouth campaign and movie going experience. We know this is truly some found footage, as the flick opens on a little card letting everyone know that it was discovered amongst the rubble in an area once known as Central Park. Hot opening. So a bunch of friends are having a going away party for their pal heading to Japan, and all hell breaks loose. And by the way, Japan? Nice nod to Godzilla right there. The city's collapsing and the streets are chaotic. A bunch of crab monsters that make you explode are running around. It's a cataclysm. Director Matt Reeves does a great job with the found footage element. It keeps the pace frantic, the scares constant, and the tension high. We only catch little glimpses of the major monster, which adds to the mystery and allure. The destruction happening throughout the city feels more real when viewed from the vantage of a person at street level. And once it gets going, it does not stop. The shaky cam might be too much for some folk, and admittedly it can be a lot. But the experience itself is a totally engrossing one, and it's something folks haven't really tried with the format in a while. Big threats like this are rare in the found footage world where curses and diseases and witches reign supreme. Floating in at number 2 we've got Norai, the curse. Speaking of curses, let's talk about Norai. This Japanese found footage mockumentary follows a prominent paranormal investigator that disappears during the filming of one of his documentaries. Following his disappearance, his house burns down, his wife dies, and all sorts of loose ends are loosened further. And it's all because of a terrible curse. As we go through the footage left behind by Kobayashi, we find out that the curse originated in the past as a demon who was meant to get revenge for those who summoned it. Something went wrong somewhere down the line and the demon possessed a woman. After that it was found that anyone who interacted with her would get the curse and it spreads from there, a daisy chain of deadly curses if you would. It's a fairly common premise, especially among Japanese horror, but it makes up for it in presentation. Norai is a slow burn. 
atmospheric and dense. There aren't any jump scares and no gimmicks either. It seeks to disturb you from the inside out by presenting you with creepy occurrence after creepy occurrence. We see everything through the lens of the cameraman and dread germinates like a seed deep within your psyche. The way it presents the story is very procedural with plenty of exposition to keep the plot moving along. This can be tiring, but it has another trick up its sleeve. There are plenty of moments where ghosts appear in the background without drawing attention to themselves, rewarding eagle-eyed viewers with a little scare to call their very own. And finally, at number one, Lake Mungo. This one messed me up, like seriously. I was walking around different after seeing this movie. It uses the mockumentary format perfectly to scare the ever-loving bejesus out of anyone watching. A family is trying to find out what happened to their daughter who drowned the summer before. After her death, strange and unexplainable occurrences begin happening around their home. If you haven't seen Lake Mungo, now is the time. No matter when you watch this video, this is the correct time to watch it. There are so many twists and reveals and details that explain what once appeared to be coincidences. It's an absolutely wild ride on the first watch through. The family reaches out to a psychic to try and explain things going on. Photographs have been discovered with baffling elements in the background and video footage seems to show a ghostly girl wandering through the house. There's a moment involving footage recovered from an old cell phone that haunts me to this day. Just writing this, I got a little spooked thinking about it. Lake Mungo is a meditation on our hidden lives and the guilt we live with. Do we really know the people in our lives? What aren't they showing us? Number five, Incantation. Apparently right now, it's the ranking for the most watched non-English horror film worldwide with over 10 million hours watching and rising. That's pretty sick right there, starting off, you know? Obviously, I couldn't leave this one off the list with a reputation like that, so here we go. Incantation is a 2022 Taiwanese found footage supernatural horror film directed by Kevin Ko and co-written by Kevin and Chang Shi Wei. Released in Taiwan March 18th, 2022, it became the highest grossing Taiwanese horror film ever made. Yeah, it's received international distribution from Netflix. Hey, hey, Netflix, so good. Since July 8th, 2022. Here's the plot. A woman named Lee Ronan narrates the film, imploring the audience to memorize an insignia and chant an incantation to bless them and lift a curse on her six-year-old daughter, Dodo. The insignia and incantation are interspersed frequently throughout the film to encourage the viewer to pray along with it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty horrifying. Ronan her boyfriend Dom and Dom's cousin Yuan break a religious taboo while documenting a ritual for their internet channel. They go to a remote village of Dom and Yuan's relatives who practice a religion worshipping an ancestral deity called Mother Buddha. The clan asks the three to submit their names with the incantation to Mother Buddha. And here we go. That night, the group spy on the clan performing a ritual where a young girl seems to be willingly prepared for sacrifice. The girl, whose body is covered completely head to toe in runes, was left in front of a tunnel, which the clan said is forbidden. Ronan waits for the girl while Dom and Yuan enter the tunnel. Uh oh. Yeah, that's not good. Yuan later emerges screaming and Dawn seemingly lifeless. Ronan and Dodo's house soon becomes infested by unexplained ghostly activities and Dodo is disturbed by a shadowy presence. They bring her to a shrine where a priest agrees to exorcise Dodo. Yunan later becomes possessed and sends copies of the tunnel footage. That's horrifying. Yeah. Just Chuck Liddelling yourself on a computer desk. Yeah, you're definitely gonna need a uh, Tylenol after that one. Ouch. The film ends with some audience participation, and I'm not gonna spoil anything, don't worry, but after watching this, I kinda understand why it's rated what it's rated. Yeah, very scary but also really good. As always, dudes, if you like what we do here too, hit the like button or leave us a comment down below. Which 2022 horror film has you hiding behind the covers? Number four, Horror in High Desert. Horror in High Desert is a 2021 American film written, produced, and directed by Dutch Marriott in a pseudo documentary format featuring found footage elements about the mysterious disappearance of a hiker in Nevada. An experienced outdoorsman vanishes in North Nevada while on an outdoor excursion. On the three year anniversary of his disappearance, his friends and loved ones recall the events leading up to the disappearance and for the first time, speak about what they think actually happened. The first part focuses on the police report of hiker Gary Hinge. Toward the end of July 2017, Gary hiked to an unspecified area in the Mojave Desert and the police conduct a search based on the last GPS of location on Gary's cell phone. As time goes by, the media stop reporting and a private investigator named Bill is asked to investigate so that the case would not be abandoned. The investigation then focuses on clues in the last of the published videos. Gary appears in frame from his home, narrating a very unusual experience 
experience. The footage found reveals that Gary was able to find his way back to some mystery cabin. There he hears chanting that seems to be human like and he eventually is attacked and the camera stops recording. Reporter and the private investigator speculate that who or what might have attacked the hiker. It is mentioned that the police have made this footage public in the hope that someone in the audience might offer some additional clues which spark a series of theories such as Area 51, atomic testing, satanic rituals, and of course, extraterrestrials. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely horrifying. I didn't even see that thing. They really do a good job at involving the audience in the experience by asking them to help continue the search, which makes the film seem so real, but not real at the same time, you know? Hey, great film. And I say aliens, that was definitely an alien. You know, I'm the alien guy, I'm just saying. Number three, Dashcam. Dashcam is a 2021 computer screen horror film directed by Rob Savage and written by Gemma Hurley, Jed Shepard, and Savage. The entire film is shot from the perspective of the main character's handheld iPhone or the dashcam in her car as she live streams her actions for viewers whose comments are displayed. Kind of hard to read and watch at the same time, but it really makes it scarier, trust me. The film, of course, is produced by Blumhouse Productions, so you know it's gonna slap. Dashcam premiered at the 2021 Toronto International Film Festival in September 2021, where it was named second runner-up for the People's Choice Award. The plot, Annie Hardy is a right-wing internet personality who live streams from her car, making music and using her viewers' comments as lyrics. Tired of COVID-19 restrictions and homelessness in Los Angeles, Annie books a flight to London. There, she pays a visit to her former bandmate, Stretch, who now works as a delivery driver. When she arrives at the restaurant, Annie is surprised to find it abandoned before she encounters the owner who offers Annie huge money to apparently transport an old woman, Angela, to an undisclosed location. Annie accepts the offer, of course, and drives with Angela while live streaming everything to her fans. And this is where it gets terrifying. Angela then vanishes into a nearby forest and the group find her standing atop of a tree to which Angela just floats down to the ground before attacking the group, showing them her supernatural abilities. Angela hunts them down, and after a terrifying scene that I'm not gonna spoil, a humanoidish creature emerges out of Angela, where it now hunts for Annie. Nope. Yeah, I would be saying a big nope too. Hell no, I'm not driving some scary old lady in the middle of the night. That's like rookie horror film nonsense right there. Great movie though, great movie. Very scary. Number two, Spree. Spree is a 2020 American comedy horror film directed by Eugene Kotlyarenko. The gonzo style satire follows a social media obsessed rideshare driver played by Joe Keery, who we all love. In an attempt to become viral, he live streams himself murdering his passengers. Ooh, it's a challenge of a role I'd say. The film also stars David Arquette, Kyle Mooney, and Misha Barton. It was executively produced by Drake. That's saying something right there. Spree premiered in 2020 at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival and was released theatrically on video on demand in 2020. The film received mixed reviews, though critics praised Curie's performance and the film's premise. I really like this movie. I think it's a good representation of 2020 culture, you know? With phones in our hand every second, everybody trying to go viral, doing anything you can for clout. This movie does just that. Okay. Here's the plot. A young man named Kurt is obsessed with being a social media star and becoming viral. Kurt finds work as a driver for a rideshare app called Spree, then fits out his car with cameras and begins a new live stream titled The Lesson where he instructs viewers on how to become famous on social media. Kurt starts picking up passengers one by one and killing them off with poison that he politely offers riders, as well as a bunch of creative clout chasing performance heinous acts. Eh, you'll see. Kurt is then stopped by two police officers who grow suspicious of him. It's revealed that Kurt's murders have already become public, with Kurt being nicknamed the Rideshare Killer. After police are unable to identify him, Kurt tries to flee, but he too is pursued by police, forcing him to crash his car through a homeless camp. With Kurt's murders becoming more well known online, Spree is temporarily shut down to allow an investigation to take place. Kurt tries to kill Jesse, the other character, but she pins him to the wall with her car and then in turn takes his phone and continues the social media presence which he started. Jesse then becomes a nationwide star after taking credit for Kurt's demise and capture surrounding the infamous rideshare killer. Yeah, I really like this movie. It's like super campy and over the top. It's serious at times, but also very gory. Joe Keery kills it with this role, and I feel like if you were needing a break from that Stranger Things character, 
Yeah, we found it. You did very well, my friend. Very terrifying. And coming in at the number one spot, VHS 94. VHS 94 is a 2021 American found footage horror anthology film and the fourth installment in the VHS series. If you haven't seen these movies, they're great. Give them a shot. They're almost shot like a bunch of stories from the same era in one film. Like little mini true or false found footage movies that make the audience ask, is this campy or did this really happen? The film originates from a screenplay written by David Bruckner and Brad Miska. The overarching plot follows a police SWAT team who stumble upon a sinister cult compound and its collection of VHS tapes and what's on them. Following the series cult origins around film festivals, VHS 94 has its world premiere at Fantastic Fest on September 26, 2021 and was also screened at the Beyond Fest on October 4th the same year. The film was released as a Shudder original film via Shudder, October 6, 2021, and later that month, Shudder announced that it had become the platform's biggest movie premiere in its history with record-breaking viewership numbers. That's awesome. Horror movies, let's go. It's great stuff, these films are awesome. Okay, here's some plots. A SWAT team gets a tip and investigates a prison cell-like haunted house with various static screens playing different found footage. The first is a Channel 6 news reporter, Holly Marciano, and her cameraman, Jeff. They are filming a story about the Rat Man, a local legend who has supposedly been living in the town's storm drains. After interviewing several citizens who have reportedly witnessed the creature to gain information, the duo descend into the storm drain where they find several homeless encampments. While, I'll do it again where they find several homeless encampments. While filming, they are approached by a man covered in black goop slime, and he murmurs, Ratma. They attempt to flee, but they are captured by other similar residents of the sewers. Yeah, I'm not gonna spoil anything else because I really like the VHS series and the mini stories that they do. They're absolutely terrifying. The vampire part is the scariest part. I'm not spoiling anything. Check it out. Number five, I want a toy. Coming up first on our list today is going to be this creepy VHS tape uploaded to YouTube, I want a toy.mp4. It's been circulating around the net for a bit, and maybe you've actually seen it before if you've got your nose to the grindstone vis a vis scary videos like yours truly. This video was uploaded to a channel called Baddington and is said to have been discovered on a lost VHS tape and has left people with a real uneasy feeling in their stomach afterwards, and not just from watching all that static. The video itself, it's only about five minutes long. But those five minutes are more than enough to make your skin crawl and your hair stand on end. I'm burpy. The footage is grainy and distorted, making it difficult to discern what exactly it is you're even watching. It feels like a staticky nightmare, like something you kind of remember but can't quite focus on. It's like a recording of a TV show you've never heard of or seen before, aimed at what looks like preschoolers or kindergartners. There's a puppet that looks like he's probably pretty good friends with Annabelle and the puppet from Saw, and he's sitting singing his lovely, horrifying rendition of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star for you. Ah, horrifying puppets and slowed down scary nursery rhymes. Is there a better combination in scary videos? If that wasn't enough for you though, things get a lot worse when our scary puppet friend seems to start degrading as the quality of the video degrades. His eyes vanish and the camera cuts to our little wooden pal saying how badly he wants a toy. He's been a good boy. I, I don't know, I gotta be honest, haunted puppet. I'll see what I can do, but I can't guarantee nothing. It might be best to keep a bit of distance between us, you and I. Now, if you enjoyed this kind of stuff, and I definitely do, that's why I made a list of it, I definitely recommend you toss Baddington a subscribe. They're a very good content creator. If you like content like this, there is a lot of haunted VHS stuff on that channel. But if you're looking for more than haunted VH stuff, analog or digital, Top 5 Scary has it all. From stories of hauntings, Halloween movies, cryptids, conspiracies, true crime, and more, we've got a little something to scare everybody. So hit subscribe and that bell, and don't miss a single scream. But take it slow, okay? Make sure you watch the rest of this video. Number four, grave robbing for morons. Do you wish you had a few extra bucks? A little side hustle to help you make a few dollars in between checks in these trying times? I know I do. Maybe you just need a hobby that can also make you a little money on the side, a little passive income. Maybe something fun like selling old cloves on Depop or I don't know, something outdoorsy like grave robbing. Luckily, there's an instructional video you have just got to see. That's our next entry, Grave Robbing for Morons. The video itself is a how-to guide for individuals interested in grave robbing. It provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to locate and dig up graves, as well as helpful little tips for avoiding detection by the authorities. Now, the video does kind of seem like it might be a joke. It's presented kind of humorous, seen on 
there's some funny graphics and sarcastic commentary. People for a long time have wondered if the video is real, if this guy's really confessing to a criminal act, or if he's just doing a joke in poor taste. Grave robbing is definitely pretty illegal, but it's also one of those things that's considered like, I don't know, highly immoral, blasphemous, if that's your sort of thing. It's fine to grave rob if you're in like a video game and you're taking Viking gold out of an old crypt, but it's a little bit different when you're cracking open coffins in real life, I would say. Now, some people argue that the video is, it's just a work of satire, it's just a joke, and you shouldn't put too much stock into a weird video uploaded to YouTube. And that the video might just be a commentary on the whole absurdity of grave robbing as a whole, and this is to discourage people from engaging in the practice. Regardless of whether or not you think it's real or not, it's definitely got a lot of us talking, so it's definitely a videotape that maybe none of us should have watched. Some people believe it should be banned, while others believe it should be protected. That's all I gotta say about that. Number three, the Paris Catacombs. The Paris Catacombs really don't need any help being scary. It's a tunnel filled with the remains of hundreds of dead bodies and more bones hanging up than a museum, so even a well-lit guided tour with a stop for some coffee and fancy snacks would probably still leave you a little bit unnerved and scared with just a dash of heebies and jeebies. Oh, if only a nice walk through the catacombs was what I was showing you. Instead, I've got a terrifying video of someone running around the catacombs like they're a first-person horror game. Now, why is someone running through the catacombs? Are they running from something that's behind them? Running in the world's worst marathon? Are they just scared because they're lost and they're desperately trying to find their way to the exit? The camera gets a lot shakier as the video keeps going and the person seems like they're running faster and faster and getting more and more stressed and scared as they try to find their way out of the never ending wet, dark, dank annals of the tunnels below. At the end of the video, the camera drops and footsteps are all you can hear. So we have no idea what happened to our first person view recording. Now, someone in the comments pointed out that something to keep in mind is that even just on the map presented of the catacombs, you can go from one side of the catacombs all the way to the other. Now, a lot of the public tour is blocked off, but there are spots where you can leave the path and wander into the depths of the catacombs. And they do not advise you to do this. In fact, they would rather prefer that you do not. You can get yourself really lost. Parisian police seal every entrance they find that isn't supposed to be on the tour, which means potentially you could go into one entrance, come back and find yourself in a sealed entrance, and you can do this for miles and miles. Explorers who are familiar with the catacombs say that the depths aren't even slightly mapped out. So there are miles and miles of just unknown catacomb out there. There are ways down no one knows and paths that could lead who knows where. Just hope you're not claustrophobic. Claustrophobia. Number two, Candle Cove. If you're really tuned into internet horror and creepy campfire stories for a digital age, then perhaps you've come across Candle Cove before. This freaky story in particular actually scared me to my core when I was younger, like really chilled my bones. So it feels very appropriate if I can traumatize a new generation. I love to give back. What can I say? I love to keep the cycle. The legend goes that Candle Cove was a TV show for younger audiences about pirates, my favorite subject. Filmed as a puppet show like something like the Thunderbirds. It first popped up on a forum for nostalgic TV where someone asked if anybody remembered this old show Candle Cove. Tons of users came out of the woodwork to share their stories and happy memories of the silly little show. It was like a group effort. Everybody tossing in what little bits of trivia they remembered. But people were frustrated that it was hard to find any footage or like DVD recordings of the show. Well, someone uploaded a clip of Candle Cove and it is pretty darn unsettling. As I've already mentioned, puppets are inherently terrifying and then you mix in some VHS artifacts scratching and screaming and something that's supposed to be innocent turns into a horror show real quick. A lot of the details about the show sound like it was way too scary for its young audience. There's a character named Skin Taker, a skeleton pirate wearing skin, or an episode that was just the puppets shaking and screaming into the camera. Now. Where the legend of Candle Cove gets downright horrifying and freaky is that someone in the original forum thread where it was first discovered returned to the post saying that he met up with his parents and he had asked if they knew anything about Candle Cove or remembered how much he used to love that show. And he was told by his mother she was always confused whenever he would talk about that pirate puppet show since whenever he'd say he was watching it, he was just sitting by the TV watching Static. 
Oh, I, it still, still to this day, sends a little chill up my spine. They eventually actually adapted the uh, the story of Candle Cove into a TV show. I can't remember what the name of it's called, so I probably shouldn't have even included this fucking right now. Maybe done some research. Got all of that. <laughs> I am who I am. Number one, skinnamarink a dink a dink This next one is short and sweet and also came out of Baddington's channel. Two shout outs in one video. Wow, we're gonna have to cut this guy a check. Well, when you're making some of the best scary VHS content out on the web, you can expect more than one shout out in a video. This video is very short but spooky. Inspired by the sleeper indie horror hit Skinnamarink, this short video focuses in on an animatronic bear, one that I'm sure fans of indie horror PC games will instantly recognize. Much like the movie Skinnamarink, the clip really lets the tension and horror build up before unleashing a torrent of jump scares on you and then fading out on a blurry, out of focus image of the bear from before, lingering on you and staring right into your soul. And I don't know when else I'll get a public platform for this, but please watch Skinnamarink if you like this sort of thing. If you like spooky VHS horror, that's literally what the whole movie is. And it's a Canadian indie horror movie, so by Canadian content, regulations, I have to mention it. Number six, the bonus haunted video. I know, I know, a sixth entry on top five scary. What is he doing? He's letting the power go to his head. I know this is top five, but I found a sixth one and it was just too good not to include. The story about it was amazing. The footage itself is horrifying and I think you'll agree with me for including it. If you found a videotape that had a mysterious blank label reading surprise, would you watch it? I feel like a lifetime of studying horror films has prepared me to know better than to do anything so stupid. Well, in 2018, a software engineer named Foon Turing discovered a mysterious VHS tape in a charity shop in Milpitas, California. The tape looked old, definitely a few decades at least, with a worn out sticker on the front reading surprise, and a smiley face looking like a prop out of a horror movie. It looked like the thing that has the girl from the ring on it. Most of us probably would have chucked that into a dumpster and set it on fire, but Foon is braver than most of us, took the tape home, and popped it into an old VHS player. We got the footage, and I'm gonna warn you, there's a reason I saved this for the end. Please don't write the channel and complain if this was too much for you. It's pretty disturbing. <laughs> Starting off in our number five spot, we have SCP-342. The SCP-342 creature normally takes the form of a mass transit ticket for the closest form of mass transportation to its current location. Currently, this demonic creature takes the form of a train ticket departing from an unknown station. When held by a person for any length of time, it will eventually change form into a transit ticket for a form of transportation its holder desires to use. This transformation always takes place when not being directly or indirectly observed, and there are no recordings of SCP-342 changing form. SCP-342 can inhabit any form of transportation ticket without being detected. If SCP-342 is validated by stamp, has its ticket stub torn off, or is disposed of in any way, it will reform into an unused ticket after a short period of time. Anyone who uses SCP-342 to board a vehicle is unable to exit their mode of transportation by any means. Once the vehicle ends its route or stops moving, the user will disappear from this reality. Users report an overpowering feeling of dread prior to boarding, and the feeling increases during the course of the travel and shortly before their disappearance, they go into a panic-induced terror. There are many terrifying things the holder of this demon can experience, like seeing increased darkness in the sky outside of the vehicle, hallucinations, or a fear of other drivers, conductors, or other transit staff. As well as feeling threatened by other people around them, occurrences completely preventing the rider from getting off of the vehicle at any time, and seeing passengers simply appear suddenly, then quickly vanish from their seats. All of these experiences are said to be like having paranoid schizophrenia. The terrifying experiences are usually only felt by the user, but sometimes bystanders and workers of the transit vehicle can experience feelings of uneasiness and will be compelled to exit the vehicle early, seeking other means of transportation. In our number four spot today, we have SCP-087. SCP-087, or otherwise known as the stairwell, is 
you guessed it, a stairwell. And when you look down, it's pitch black with an unknown ghost-like figure at the bottom. This photo of the ghost figure has only been captured once, and we still don't know if SCP-087 is one entity or a group. The stairs descend on a 38 degree angle for 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform. The design of the staircase limits subjects to a visual range of approximately one and a half flights. A light source is required for any subjects exploring this creature as there are no lighting fixtures or windows present. Due to the darkness and design, the subject needs an extremely bright source of light to be able to see the bottom. It's been seen that lighting sources brighter than 75 watts have been shown ineffective because SCP-087 seems to be able to absorb excess light. Subjects who have explored this creature have gotten an audio recording of what seems to be a distressed vocalization from what is presumed to be a child, but its age is unknown. The source of the distress calls is estimated to be located around 200 meters below the initial platform. However, any attempts to descend the staircase have failed to bring subjects closer to the source. The depth is believed to be far beyond the possible structure of both the building and geological surroundings. At this point, it is unknown if SCP-087 has an end point. Many people who have tried to learn more about this creature have suddenly gone missing during their exploration. It is believed that whatever or whoever is beyond the platform has extreme powers and can quickly grab the subject they desire with no one even noticing. Many believe that either below the platform or at the bottom of the stairs is the gateway to hell or even SCP hell where there are hundreds or thousands of SCP creatures that reside there. The the mystery of these disappearances and the fact that we don't know much about this SCP-087 makes it even more terrifying. We don't know what it's truly capable of, or if they work alone, or if it's a group of creatures preying on humans. In our number 3 spot today we have SCP-088. SCP-088 is a humanoid with reptile-like features which appears to be in a mummified form, but it's merely in a state of hibernation from which it may recover if it is exposed to a more hospitable environment than its current containment. Research has indicated that SCP-088 is approximately 6,000 years old and is capable of producing a variety of hazardous biological compounds from its mouth and hands. Some of these substances could be of great strategic value if replicated, but until a means to extract them without awakening SCP-088 is found, reach is on hold. This demonic creature is currently sealed in its air tight case 24-7. The case is constructed of transparent acrylic plastic to resist the corrosive properties this creature possesses. This monster has been contained for more than 70 years and has only risen from its hibernation state twice. Each time personnel was exposed to the awoken demon, they experienced a painful mutation after which they shared the physical characteristics of SCP-088. This creature also has demonstrated the ability to produce potent neurotoxins in liquid and gas form to combat containment personnel. SCP-088 was first recovered around the 1930s from a subterranean complex below Los Angeles, California. The site was originally discovered by a man known as GWS using a device he called a radio x-ray. After mapping a series of tunnels and gold deposits below the city, G declared that he found the lost city of lizard people as described in the legends of Arizona's Hopi tribe. The SCP-088 was recovered with the mummified remains of 23 other beings sharing a similar morphology. However, none of these beings found with this creature were alive and examination suggests that they may have been originally human or possibly even half lizard, half man. Due to this creature being so dangerous to humans, it's been very hard for people to be able to research it or its origins, so many findings relating to the SCP-088 can't completely be confirmed and may never be due to the damage it can cause to humans. In our number two spot today, we have SCP-173. Moving on to our next creature, we have SCP-173, the Sculpture. At a first glance at this creature, it may appear harmless or just a little creepy, but as it is a roughly humanoid concrete structure with stubby arms and legs with green and red facial features made from Cryon brand spray paint.
state. But don't underestimate its abilities from its looks, as this scary creature is incredibly swift and is known to capture anyone as its victim. SCP-173 is considered a Euclid-class SCP with Class 4 hazardous containment procedures, and the very first being captured by the SCP Foundation. It is the most well-known SCP of all time, rightfully so. The creature's origin is still unknown, but one thing is for sure is that it is very hostile towards any life form. There have been reports of sounds of scraping stones within their container when no one is inside. To prevent SCP-173 from escaping, it must be locked in its container at all times. When personnel enters SCP-173's container, a minimum of three must be locked inside the container with the creature. To stop any mishaps, two people must maintain direct eye contact with him at all times, and they need to notify each other when they are going to blink as it is only able to move when no one is looking. And for that reason, you may not want to take your eyes off of this one, or you may be in deep trouble. In our number one spot today, we have SCP-993. SCP-993 is also known as Bobble the Clown. This is a humanoid creature that directly resembles the appearance of a clown. Bobble is known for his cruelty and sadistic behavior hidden behind the cheerful and colorful face of a clown. It's the scariest thing in the world. Arguably one of the scariest SCP for the fact that his main objective is brainwashing children through a television show. Bobble performs illegal and immoral acts and takes joy from watching his victims suffer. Okay, creepy clown, don't invite him to your birthday party. Additionally, he takes delight in twisting and manipulating people through his television show. Bobble the Clown was first discovered by the Foundation after they found its show, where in every episode, Bobble would teach a new lesson to its viewers to do illegal acts and cause violence, while giving explicit step-by-step -step instructions on how to commit these crimes. These actions became ingrained into subjects' minds, making them obsessed to carry out the actions themselves. Additionally, repeated exposure to SCP-993's show will cause severe mental illness issues. Protocol for any SCP-993 broadcast is to be intercepted and blocked from public viewing, though episodes are regularly still getting broadcast from an unknown source. All broadcasts are to be recorded and stored for future viewing. While while any subjects used to view SCP-993 must be given a Class A amnesiac after they have described the episode. With its short temper, Bobble the Clown can quickly lose his happy and cheerful mask and become incredibly sadistic, using his supernatural abilities to stalk and spy on enemies to find their weaknesses, making SCP-993 one of the scariest SCPs out there. Number 5. The Last Broadcast this 1998 American horror film written, produced, and directed by Stefan Avalos and Lance Wheeler tells the story of a documentary filmmaker named David Lee and his investigation on the fact or fiction murders in which got him convicted in a 1995 case, apparently with the murders of his team one night during an expedition to find the mythic Jersey Devil in the Jersey Pine Barrens. The film is shot mockumentary style and employs the found footage technique. The film is believed to be the first full-length feature film shot and edited entirely on consumer-level digital equipment. And on a budget, too. I love this. I'm all here for it. Main character Lee seeks to discover the truth behind these killings while making his documentary. Four men go to the Pine Barrens, where a psychic leads them to the apparent site. During the hunt, they broadcast a live show simultaneously via TV, internet, and amateur radio. They enter the Barrens, but only one emerges alive, as the others are brutally murdered. The likely suspect would appear to be Stephen. Oof, spooky. Seward, the only suspect, is then charged with the murder of his team. During his murder trial, Lee receives a box containing a damaged videotape reel, which he at first assumes is the tape from the team. With the murders caught on the tape, a blurred image of the real killer is seen and is shocked to discover that the killer is the filmmaker himself, Lee. This is a great one. I really enjoyed this movie. It's low budget, young artists, it's a pretty good storyline too. And number four, Man Bites Dog. Man Bites Dog is a 1992 Belgian violent comedy crime mockumentary written, produced, and directed by Remy Balval, André Bonzal, and Benoit Poulvard. I tried, sorry. Who are also the film's co-editors, cinematographers, and lead actor. The film received the André Cavins Award for the best film by the Belgian Film Critics Association, and since its release, the picture has become a cult classic 
and received a rare NC-17 rating for its release in the US. Yeah, I'd up that rating to a rated R if it was me. After watching bits and pieces, ah, I can't even say that without getting chills. Look, it's pretty disturbing stuff. Shot in black and white, it's gory, like very gory. Like if Tarantino made a gory snuff film. Yeah, I actually can't even put a clip into this because the found footage parts are way too disturbing. The film follows a crew of filmmakers following a serial killer, recording his horrific crimes for a documentary they are producing. At first though, dispassionate observers, they find themselves increasingly caught up in the chaotic and nihilistic violence, eventually becoming accomplices themselves. Ben, a witty, charismatic, and an easily enraged sadistic serial killer, takes the filmmakers and the crew to witness and watch the murders, explaining why, how, and when he chooses his victims. The viewer witnesses this grisly killings and crimes in graphic detail. The camera crew becomes more and more involved with the murders and even help Ben. During filming, two of Ben's crews are killed by Italian mobsters and Ben and his crew have fun taking turns as they shoot the rival crew members while recording the entire process. Like I said, it's gory. Tons more gruesome killings and Ben is finally arrested, but then escapes. At this point, someone takes revenge on Ben and he finds his girlfriend and family all disturbingly murdered in revenge. The camera crew and Ben are all ambushed and shot by the rival mobsters. After the camera falls, it keeps running and the film ends with the death and of the fleeing of the suspects. Only watch this film if you can stomach disturbing scenes. Trust me, it's pretty visual. Number three, Creep. Creep is a 2014 American found footage psychological horror directed by Patrick Bryce and is filmed as found footage and does the genre well. Bryce portrays a videographer assigned to record an eccentric client insisting on filming numerous videos for his future unborn kid. Creep was inspired by Bryce's experiences on Craigslist. Bryce and lead actor Dupla refined the film's story during filming which resulted in multiple versions of each scene and several alternate scenarios and endings. Struggling videographer Aaron accepts an assignment to travel to a remote cabin where he meets his client Joseph, who explains he has an inoperable brain tumor and is expected to die before his pregnant wife gives birth. With this, he wishes to have Aaron record a video diary for his unborn child and throughout the videos, Joseph demonstrates behavior that makes Aaron a little uneasy, which leads in Joseph confessing some pretty heinous stuff to him. As an increasingly freaked out Aaron intercepts a phone call from Angela, who's actually Joseph's sister, and warns Aaron to escape, Joseph then attempts to stop Aaron, leading to with Aaron escaping. Then, at home, Aaron starts receiving items in the mail from Joseph, including a recording of Joseph digging a grave. Creepy. A DVD is then sent to Aaron, offering an apology in a public setting, which Joseph then kills him from behind with an axe. Spoiler alert, Joseph, now calling himself Bill, later receives a phone call from his newest target as he places a DVD of Aaron's murder alongside recordings of his past victims. That's scary. Yeah, I saw a play about a gruesome Craigslist ad once. They can get pretty disturbing. The film is widely known as one of Netflix's best found footage genre movies, and there's some great jump scares in there for you. Check it out yourselves. Number two, UFO abduction, the McPherson tape. UFO abduction, also known as the McPherson tapes, is a 1989 American found footage sci-fi horror film written, produced, and directed by Dean Alialto. The film focuses on a family who are being terrorized by extraterrestrials during a birthday celebration. The late 80s and the early 90s were ravished by an overflow of popular paranormal genre movies and TV such as The X-Files and Unsolved Mysteries. The film begins with a brief introduction that proposes the film as legitimate and one of the strongest pieces of evidence for ETs yet. On October 8th, 1983, the Van Heese family gathers in Connecticut woods to celebrate five-year-old sister's birthday. One of the brothers uses his handheld camera to record the night's events. The evening passes relatively un eventful as the family celebrates. However, after a small power outage, the brothers walk to the neighbors to investigate and the three eventually come across an extraterrestrial spaceship landed in the woods and are shocked to see three small aliens walking around. Oh my God. Oh my God. Holy sh Holy sh Holy sh <sighs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's creepy. They flee in a panic after the aliens notice them. Yeah, I would too if I saw them just walking around the forest. They return to the house and load shotguns, but are divided on whether they should remain in the house or leave. Classic horror movie move. 
After a while, they assume the visitors have left, but notice all their watches have stopped. They conclude the party, but are terrified as the aliens attempt to enter the house through the windows and chimney. Eric, one of the brothers, shoots and brings an alien's body inside the place and puts it in the back room. After securing the house once more and turning up the radio to block out the voices, the others finally convince Michael, another brother, to put down his camera and resume their card game. From its position across the room, the recording camera glitches and records what looks like three small grey aliens emerging from the back room. The tape ends as the aliens close in on the family. The film claims that the Van Heese's whereabouts are still unknown and that viewers should contact the producers if they have any information. Look, I'm the guy who wears the tinfoil hats, this is pretty good. I liked it. The footage from the woods, the small creatures, the Project Blue Book warning at the beginning of the film, it's a sci fires Friday night. Great film, and short, only an hour. And coming in at the number one spot, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a 2003 American horror film starring Jessica Biel and R. Lee Ermey. Its plot we're probably all familiar with if we've seen the numerous takes on this classic movie. It follows a group of young adults traveling through Texas who encounter Leatherface and his murderous family. A remake of Toby Hooper's 1974 film and the fifth of the franchise. Erin and her boyfriend and friends are on their way to a Leonard Skinner concert in Texas. While driving through Texas, the group picks up a severely traumatized hitchhiker walking in the middle of the road. After they talk with the hitchhiker, she takes her own life with a concealed pistol. The group contacts police where they are led to an old plantation house where Thomas Hewitt is waiting, also known as Leatherface. Aaron escapes and heads towards the woods, but Leatherface, armed with his chainsaw, follows each of the concert-driven friends one by one in an all-out slasher gore fest. Yeah, I watched this movie when I was 11 years old. No wonder I can't sleep at night. Aaron escapes into the woods with Leatherface chasing close behind her and her friends, but she eventually injures him and halts the pursuit. Leatherface suddenly appears in the road and slashes the car with his chainsaw, but Aaron manages to escape. Two days later, two investigating officers are killed by Leatherface while doing a crime scene investigation of the Hewitt home, and the narrator states that this case still remains open. Come on back here, follow me. Come uh, yeah, that's absolutely terrifying, all right? Seems like this franchise was loosely based around a cannibalistic family in the South and actual evidence, case, and trial of Ed Gain. Number five, Grave Encounters. Now you guys had a lot to say about this particular film in the first part of this series and rightly so because put it this way if every episode of Most Haunted was as awesome as this then we'd have enough content to keep us going for the next few decades. Written and directed by the Vicious Brothers aka Colin Minahan and Stuart Ortiz, Grave Encounters is a 2011 Canadian supernatural horror film that strikes at the vein of paranormal reality TV. Which as I mentioned previously is a much needed antidote to the fan footage genre as a whole. We as an audience need to be able to suspend our disbelief when faced with such a personal depiction of horror. Again, it strikes the question, why are they still filming? Well, this film follows Lance Preston, the charismatic host of Grave Encounters, an infamous ghost investigation TV series, and his crew as they make their way through the abandoned mental asylum Collingwood Psychiatric Hospital. What plays out is a genuinely nerve-wracking classical ghost story. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, there's not much more to the plot other than the pursuit of the paranormal. and the pains that come with it. But as far as that goes, Grave Encounters does it very convincingly and it's jammed with some genuinely uneasy moments. So much so that the Vicious Brothers have extended the Grave Encounters series and developed quite the cult following in the process. Coming in next at number 4, Devil's Pass. Now, if you're aware of the Dyatlov Pass incident, then this film will definitely strike a chord as a terrifying adaptation of the notorious unexplained mystery. For those of you not aware with the mystery, the Dyatlov Pass incident was the unsolved death of nine ski hikers in the northern Ural Mountains in 1959, in the then former Soviet Union. To this date, their cause of death is still undetermined, and the strange occurrences surrounding the Dyatlov Pass incidents has been the imaginative spark for dozens of conspiracy theories and paranormal 
Paranormal Tales. So as far as a horror movie goes, Devil's Pass draws from some pretty impressive source material. Directed by Rennie Harlan, the man responsible for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, Devil's Pass follows the story of five college students who are determined to make a film about the Dyatlov mystery and what plays out is an unnerving interpretation of the events that transpired. To be honest, if you're not a fan of conspiracy theories and government cover ups, you might feel a bit bogged down with this film, but if you are, then Devil's Pass is a sci-fi horror heart pounding ride through the found footage genre that's smartly made and surprisingly hilarious in parts. Next up at number 3, Hell House LLC. What are you looking at? Holy <laughs> Got me man. <laughs> All right, weirdo. I went into this film with zero expectations and was terrifyingly surprised at how bloody good it was. If you're a fan of The House's October Built, which was featured on our first list, then you'll find all of the same tropes in Hell House, but with more emphasis on the documentary style meta world building that fan footage is so well built for. This film kind of went under the radar for most people and was shipped directly to on demand services. But what's surprising about this film is how well made it is for something that was never in intended to be seen on the big screen. To be honest, Hell House never really strays too far from its driving paranormal mystery and we're never fully given an explanation that diverges from the main cast perspective, but that's also why it kind of works. There's no exposition in this film at all and that's the way it should be, and it convincingly captures the feeling of the unknown. By playing out as a slow crawl that gradually unravels in media res, what we get is a genuinely terrifying paranormal mystery that if we suspend our disbelief, could just as well be real. Swinging in at number two, The Taking of Deborah Logan. Hey, letting all my heat out. To be honest, this film could get on this list just for one scene in particular, and if you've seen The Taking of Deborah Logan, then you'll know exactly what scene I mean. If you've never seen this film, you've probably already seen the gif of it, because holy moly, that one's messed up. I don't say this lightly, The Taking of Deborah Logan is a really, really good horror flick, irregardless of the fan photo genre. I think then that's part of the reason why it was dismissed, people were tired of the same old, same old, and as soon as they heard the phrase found footage slapped onto it, they didn't give it the chance it deserved. But what they would have found is a convincing display of found footage horror at its best. Directed and co written by Adam Robitaille, The Taking of Deborah Logan follows a documentary crew who are making a research film on patients suffering from Alzheimer's. Their subject is Deborah Logan, an elderly woman with an aggressive form of the disease, but as the crew quickly realises, that prognosis is pretty far from being correct, and there's something much more sinister at work. One of my favourite parts of this film is Gavin, who after finding out that there's ritualistic murders involved, he just straight up quits on the spot and leaves. I love it, and we never see him again, he's just straight up gone living his best life. Remember guys, if you ever find yourself in a horror movie situation, be more Gavin. And finally, our number one spot, The Tunnel. Holy moly, this film is ridiculously good. Equal parts thoroughly entertaining, convincingly made, and just straight up terrifying. Which makes it so much more impressive then that this is essentially a fan made film, crowdfunded by selling individual digital frames for a dollar a piece. Now, I will forgive most criticisms with this film, and to be honest, if you weren't a fan of the Blair Witch Project, then in all likelihood you won't enjoy this. It is very unforgiving with its handheld sequences, there's a lot of disorientating shots, but I don't know about you, that's exactly what I want in found footage horror. I want to feel like I've stumbled upon a tape that shouldn't be seen. It's the reason why I believe found footage horror can be so effective when it's done right. It's not entirely what we see, it's the small moments of chaos that force our imagination to fill in the gaps. On top of that, we have an extra layer of exposition from the documentary sequence, allowing us to witness how the imminent threat ahead has already affected the survivors. What we get is a terrifying display of claustrophobic horror that seriously is edge of your seat stuff. Give this one a watch and then let me know your 
thoughts in the comment box down below and maybe we'll have enough traction to pull off a part three. Number five on this list is SCP-966. SCP-966 is a very disturbing type of creature that needs to be caught. The SCP Foundation describes them as predatory creatures that resemble hairless humans possessing an elongated face with a mouth lined with needle-like teeth. On each hand, they have five claws that can be up to 20 centimeters long. Although sharp, these are easily broken, making them unfit for combat. SCP-966's height ranges from 1.4 to 1.6 meters, and they can reach up to 30 kilograms in weight. Physically, SCP-966 are weak, possessing hollow bones and low muscular density. They do not seem to rest through sleep. Instead, they will suddenly cease all movement at seemingly random intervals of time, resuming normal activity three to five minutes later. Now those creatures don't sound very appealing to me, and even though they have weak bones, they aren't something that I'd want to have a run-in with by myself. And my instincts hold true because humans are on the menu for SCP-966. The problem is the way that they hunt. Because they're so frail, a head-on attack isn't how they get their prey. They need to be a lot more stealthy. So what they do instead is emit a very high pitched frequency that won't allow the individual hearing it to engage in any sleep at all. This applies to REM sleep all the way to micro sleep. It's said that the range of this high pitched frequency is 20 meters and once you're hit with it, there's no going back. SCP-966 will then stalk you until your exhaustion incapacitates you to a point where it can safely attack and consume you. Along with exhaustion, this high pitch frequency can also bring on vivid hallucinations and sharp changes in someone's temperament. So far, there's been no cure for being hit with this frequency, so even if you're capable of finding SCP-966 and killing it before you get too tired, you'll be doomed to live the rest of your life without sleep, which is effectively a death sentence anyways. Ever since this SCP has been discovered, Discovered, the numbers have been thinned, but there's still many of them on the loose and at large. Number four on this list is SCP-3129. SCP-3129 is a very strange SCP that can't really ever be caught because it's just a phenomenon that occurs. That being said, we need to develop some way to either catch it or stop it from happening because it's very detrimental to our society. There are three stages to this SCP. The first stage, as described by the Foundation, is when phenomena invariably focus upon a human male aged somewhere between 40 and 50, hereafter designated SCP-3129-1. SCP-3129 transmissions can vary in presentation and length wildly, but invariably remain on the topic of SCP-3129-1's apparent election bid. No instances of SCP-3129 have been found outside of the continental United States or present in any non-English languages. So stage one is basically something that occurs on television vision and appears to those who are watching. Stage 2, as described by the Foundation, begins after 2-4 to four weeks of exposure to Stage 1 phenomena. Up to 8% of viewers will become fixated upon SCP-31291. Civilians more politically aligned with the ideas presented in SCP-3129 commercials are more susceptible to infection. SCP-3129 adverts have not shown any overall political bias. Class B amnestics are effective at treating Stage 2 infection. Now the final stage that the foundation describes is an infection displaying fanatical devotion to SCP-31291. They argue with open hostility against opposing viewpoints and ideologies. Stage 3 infected tend to seek out other infected in person and by way of online message boards and communities. This SCP isn't as dangerous as some of the others on this list to our health, but to our society it's by far the most detrimental. Whatever or whoever SCP-3129 chooses to support those who witness its occurrence will also feel extremely passionate about the same thing. It's effectively a brainwashing tool that no one is in control of. This SCP completely destroys any sense of democracy and takes away our human free will. I don't know how you could catch something like this, but finding a way to identify it when it happens and interfere with the broadcast, I mean, that's definitely something that we need to be looking into. Number three on this list is SCP-169. SCP-169 is one of the SCPs on this list that has the potential to kill millions Aliens if it's so desired. The Foundation describes this creature as a marine arthropod of enormous size, 
known as the Leviathan by generations of sailors and oral history. Presumed at first to be a myth, SCP-169 was detected by Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 during an investigation of paranormal activity around the archipelago. During Y6's investigation, a doctor whose name they don't reveal discovered the archipelago to have moved at least 3 kilometers from its original location. Though initially the doctor believed this motion to be due to unusually quick continental drift, a reconnaissance mission performed by the USS revealed the archipelago to be the protrusions of rock-like plates covering an enormous organic mass. The foundation was brought in immediately to begin threat management. The foundation goes on to say that they think this arthropod size is somewhere between 2,000 to 8,000 kilometers long. The foundation does not specify which archipelago they're talking about, but they do say that if this arthropod was to go deeper into the ocean or the earth, then all these islands would sink as well. The one positive thing about all of this is that the creature is thought to only breathe once every three months. This has led experts to believe that it's in a dormant state and it's not fully awake right now. If it did ever become fully awake and aware, then who knows what this creature is capable of doing. I live in Ontario and the north to south distance of this province is 1,691 kilometers, meaning that this creature could be two, three, or even four times the size of Ontario. I doubt we'd ever be able to fully catch this beast based on how big it is, but some means of containment, I mean, that would definitely be Nice. Number two on this list is SCP-3310. SCP-3310 is honestly not much to look at at all. In fact, it's just a tree stump that's floating in a lake. But it's what that tree stump can cause that makes it so dangerous. The Foundation describes SCP-3310 as a 9 meter tall tree stump floating in Crater Lake. SCP-3310 is anomalously able to float upright with approximately 1.2 meters of the top remaining above the water at any given time. If from moved from the water and returned, SCP-3310 will return to this position. SCP-3310 floats around Crater Lake as a result of non-anomalous weather patterns. The restriction of this movement causes two distinct and possibly linked anomalous phenomena referred to as SCP-33101 and SCP-33102. Previously, activation events were caused by the removal of SCP-3310 from Crater Lake, but recent activation events have occurred while SCP-3310 remained in Crater Lake. Both of these phenomena demanifest after the triggering cause for the manifestation is ended. Now the first of these phenomena that the foundation is referring to will cause a great fog to appear over the surrounding areas with torrential rainfalls. In some of the events that have happened, over three meters of water have rained down in a very short amount of time, causing massive flooding. The second phenomena has several unknown humanoid entities appear and flock to this tree stump. The entities change depending on the time this happens, and no one has any idea who or what they are. This is why this SCP needs to be stopped and captured. Floods aren't great, but we can deal with those. The entities and what they are capable of, though, is completely unknown to us. One time this happens, they may decide to attack us humans, and without any knowledge of their strength, we might not be able to stop them. For now, we can at least take comfort that we know where this SCP will be, but capturing and containing it should be at the forefront of the Foundation's mind. Number one on this list is SCP-973. SCP-973 is a very unique SCP that only manifests itself on a 60 kilometer stretch of highway, but it's certainly one of the deadliest that I've come across. The SCP Foundation describes this as being two entities. SCP-931 is a police cruiser resembling those used by state troopers in the early 1970s. The vehicle appears to be in an advanced state of disrepair. Eyewitnesses accounts have consistently mentioned large dents in the doors and hood, a heavily cracked windshield shield, heavy rusting, and a loose rear bumper secured with duct tape. SCP-932 is reported as a Caucasian male in his late 40s wearing a state trooper uniform dating from the same time period as SCP-9731. Subject is described as balding, slightly overweight, and having a handlebar mustache. Now nobody knows for sure how this SCP came to be. Some people speculate that this was an old police officer who died along this road and now haunts it. If that is the case though, he was very serious about his job because he only shows up on this high highway for a very specific event. It needs to be at night, it needs to be on this stretch of highway, and there needs to be somebody driving along that road who's going above the speed limit. If all of those things are met, then SCP-973 has the potential to materialize and will begin chasing down the person driving. While this is happening, the target's radio will simultaneously start malfunctioning and repeating over and over again, run. Over the years, 34 bodies have been found and 19 vehicles have been discovered. I would go into 
into detail about how these bodies were discovered, but it's honestly so graphic that YouTube would definitely flag this video. There have only been five survivors and they've all had serious mental trauma from this experience. I'm not sure how you'd catch SCP-973, but something has to be done to stop these brutalistic deaths from continuing. Kicking off at number five, the McPherson tape, 1998. Kurt, Kurt, they're on the roof. Kurt, what are we gonna do, man? We're on the roof. Oh, Close the also known as Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County, the McPherson tape is an incredible display of science fiction horror done well, in a time when the found footage subgenre was just finding its feet. I'll be honest with you guys, when I first saw the McPherson tape as a kid, when it was broadcast as a straight to TV film, I thought it was actually real. And I wasn't alone either, because when it originally aired on UPN on January 18th, 1998, hundreds of people called in to verify that it wasn't actually portraying real life events. So so much so that the Lake County Sheriff's Department had to release a statement reassuring viewers that the events didn't take place. The McPherson tape centers around a family of the same name who have gathered together for Thanksgiving at their lake house when things quickly and mysteriously go wrong. As usual, I don't want to spoil any plot points for this film because it's definitely worth a watch, but if you're terrified of the thought of little green men roaming around your house at night, then you'll definitely be a fan of this film. Coming in at number four, The House's October Built, 2014. And yeah, this film is great fun and so damn creepy for the most part. Directed by Bobby Rowe alongside hit producer Steven Schneider, the man behind the original Paranormal Activity, Insidious and The Devil Inside, The House's October Built is a fantastic spin on the fan photo genre and features some genuinely terrifying set pieces throughout. It gives you that weird sense of dread that the subgenre tries so wholeheartedly to capture, but this film does it to perfection in parts. The House's October Built focuses on a group of friends, all horror fans, May I add, traveling throughout southern USA in the lead up to Halloween. They've got an obsession with live action haunted house attractions and the film plays out as a kind of mini road trip, ramping up the fake scares as it plays out. But while well, the fake scares quickly turn into real scares and the second half of the movie really manages to turn up the heat. The strength of this film is how personal it feels. There's no wider scope other than the events that unfold before us and it's backed up by a genuinely believable cast and likeable characters, which makes the ending that much more bleak. Give it a watch. Next up at number three, Noroi, The Curse, 2005. Now, this is for sure an interesting film, to say the least, and it's a welcome sore thumb in the world of Japanese horror. It comes from renowned director Koji Shirashi, who's made quite the name for himself as a fan footage auteur, with films like Occult and Shirome, a departure from the short and settling style often found in J-horror. Naroi is perhaps the best example of his work, and it stands out as a slow-burning mockumentary of paranormal investigation in Japan. Naroi features an absolutely mammoth task, interweaving several storylines that lead up to a deeply disturbing ending. For the most part though, it focuses on Masafumi Kobayashi, a paranormal expert famous for uncovering supernatural mysteries and his investigation of a strange woman and her young son. It manages to give us just enough to keep the mystery going, and I don't say this lightly, pretty much every scene is unsettling as we quickly realise that there are much more malevolent powers at play. Swinging in at number two, The Blair Witch Project, 1999. And you just knew this one would make this list, didn't you? Of course, perhaps the most famous found footage horror film of all time, and many people's first horrific dive into the subgenre. The Blair Witch Project is an awesome horror film, I'm gonna say it, and the impact that it had on the genre as a whole can't be denied. The reason that The Blair Witch Project is so damn good is because it managed to pull off exactly what terrifies us, a stark reminder that what really scares us is the stuff that we can't see, especially in a time when horror 
cinema was trying its hardest to deliver full frontal fear. Again, like with the McPherson tape, the Blair Witch Project relied heavily on viral marketing. Even a year after its release, the three actors, Heather Donoghue, Joshua Leonard and Michael C. Williams were listed on their IMDb pages as missing or deceased. The film's creators, Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez, made huge strides in creating a working mythology for the film, drawing on 18th century folk legends to fabricate their own occultist backdrop, hinting to the viewer that perhaps there was some truth to the events of the film. In essence, it's what makes found footage horror so good when it's done well, an uneasy mix between horror fiction and horror fact. And finally, our number one spot, The Borderlands 2013. Also known as Final Prayer in the US, but come on, the original title is so much better. The Borderlands is a 2013 British horror film written and directed by Elliot Goldner in his directorial debut. I'm going to say it, this film is awesome for many reasons, but the main reason is that it answers a question that somewhat mires the believability of fan footage horror. Why are they still filming? Well, The Borderlands has a pretty decent answer for that. Three men who were sent by the Vatican to provide evidence of demonic occurrences in a remote church in rural Britain. I really, really don't want to spoil anything in this film because I sincerely urge you to watch it if you haven't. But, but in my opinion, this is one of the best found footage horror films of recent times. It's equal parts The Wicker Man and equal parts The Exorcist, and it's an awesome display of British folk horror, an emerging subgenre that is really hitting the mark for this particular horror fan. Really, guys, I can't say much more other than just watch this one because it's really. In at number five, we have SCP 096 The Shy Guy. 096 is also known as the shy guy, but do not let his name fool you. His appearance alone can terrify even the toughest person. They are one of the most horrific SCP creatures of all. They are an emaciated, bone white, hairless humanoid with long dangly arms and legs. This creature tends to be docile, but it has one trigger that makes them highly dangerous whenever someone looks directly at their face. Their face has blank eyes and a mouth that can stretch up to five times the normal size of a regular human. No matter how close you are to this creature, if you look at its face, even from a far distance or just for a second, it will go berserk. If this happens, it will start to flail, cry and babble before chasing down the offender and violently attacking them. If 096 gets provoked and someone looks at their face, it will stop at nothing to take down their prey. There isn't an obstacle it cannot get past. It can smash through steel doors and walls, running endlessly across huge distances, and even able to swim to the very bottom of the ocean to pluck said offender and destroy them. The only ability it does not have is it isn't able to fly, but it uses its extremely long arms to run, similar to a gorilla that uses their arms along with their legs to walk, and they launch off the ground to gain air and distance for a quicker capture of their prey. If this destructive creature is able to get captured, they must have a bag put on their head to make everyone that is around them safe. But accidents happen, and they have happened. 096 is one of the most well known, iconic, and recognizable SCPs of all time. In at number three, we have SCP 106 The Old Man. 106, or otherwise known as the old man, is a terrifying looking elderly humanoid. Do not let his older appearance fool you, he is deadly. This creature has the general appearance of a human but looks like a rotting or decaying corpse. It is not too agile and can remain motionless for days at a time, waiting for his prey to come to him. This creature is capable of scaling any vertical surface and can remain suspended upside down indefinitely. When 106 will attempt to incapacitate their prey by damaging major organs, muscle groups or tendons, they then pull prey into its pocket dimension. They prefer human prey from 10 to 25 years old, but if they haven't had prey for a while, they will take anyone or any living thing. This creature is very smart and has many abilities, making it hard to capture. They are able to cause corrosion effect in all solid matter. It touches, engaging a physical breakdown in materials several seconds after contact. This is observed as rusting, rotting and cracking of materials 
materials and the creation of a black mucus like substance similar to the material that coats 106. It is also capable of passing through solid matter, leaving behind a large patch of its corrosive mucus. This demonic monster remains in a maximum secure area. No physical interaction with 106 is allowed at any time. All staff must stay away and they need to always stay at least 6 meters away from the cell, except in the event of a security breach. He resides in a sealed container comprised of a lead lined steel and it is sealed within 40 layers of identical material. The cell is also suspended in the air so that this creature can never be able to escape. Any object or material lost to SCP-106 is deemed missing and no recovery attempts are to be made under any circumstances. If this creature escapes, it could be detrimental. In at number 2 we have SCP-049, The Plague Doctor. 049, otherwise known as the Plague Doctor, is popular among SCP fans. At first glance, it's not the most terrifying creature out there. It's dressed like a man who was dressed in a black hooded robe and a silvery ceramic mask with long bird like nose. It has since been found out that this attire is an extension of his body, being fused permanently and organically to his flesh. It is a humanoid entity around 6 feet tall and resembles the appearance of a medieval Plague Doctor. This creature's intent is ridding the world of the disease, which has yet to be elaborated on, so no one really knows what his true motive is. He selectively chooses which patients he wants to operate on, and his mysteriousness makes him even more terrifying. His touch is fatal, and when he has a cadaver to work on, he cuts them open with no medicine and makes them watch while he performs on them with a strange set of medical tools and serums. Once the operation is complete to the plague doctor's standards, the patients are never the same again, and they lack any higher brain power functions, so they tend to roam around in a zombie like state. 049 goes from patient to patient because that is what they enjoy and what motivates them, so they try and find the right match quickly. If they go too long without finding a victim, they grow impatient and go completely nuts, ultimately tearing their targets apart in anger. This demonic creature is smart enough to speak but usually chooses not to. He is silent but deadly. When he does choose to speak, he rarely deviates from the subject of curing the pestilence. Under no circumstance should you ever come in contact with this creature due to his unpredictability and sudden burst of rage. You never know what it will be like and it could be deadly for you. The Plague Doctor is the stuff of nightmares and horror movies and you should avoid it at all costs. And finally in at number 1 we have SCP-682, the hard to destroy reptile. One of the scariest and most well known SCP creatures is the hard to destroy reptile. It is a massive cold blooded quadruped with more intelligence than a human. Despite being highly intelligent, he is also extremely dangerous and hateful towards pretty much every living thing. This demonic creature enjoys showing humans and other life forms his distaste for them by ripping them to pieces. It also has massive strength, speed, reflexes and can regenerate flesh at a rapid pace and is able to adapt to hostile environments in the blink of an eye. Other abilities this creature possesses is it can bring itself back from the dead. Many have attempted with everything from bullets to acid and fire to even nuclear bombs, but nothing can destroy this beast, not even other SCP creatures are able to destroy this monster. It can also evolve and change its body when needed. It can consume organic or inorganic materials to provide for the necessary mass and it has been known to grow additional organs. This creature was discovered by the foundation after it killed a few farmers on the grounds of being disgusted. If you try and destroy him or get your revenge on this creature, good luck because it is damn near impossible, hence its nickname, the hard to destroy reptile. It could appear as though you did destroy it but that is exactly what they want you to think. They will appear dead at first but then quickly adapt and find a counter to said opponent, returning to life with even more abilities than before. One example was that the beast was launched into the sun. It returned a few days later as a winged fire creature which caused massive, dis which caused massive devastation when it landed back on earth. The creature is one of the most dangerous creatures in possession by the foundation for all its abilities and its hatred for all life. 